torches. And since it, you know it's a, such a small group, we should just have a dialogue. I can sure. lecture, but it's not as can interesting for you or for me. Yeah, one thing. Can you move to the head of the table, please? It would be much easier to like. Uh, to, uh, well, you can't block okay. this because I'm so tall. Yeah, all right, fair enough. If you if you if you sit towards the corner, we would probably be able to Is see that you. Is better? And the, would you yeah. prefer that? Some some way it would be easier to. And and this uh, this screen is not centered, so you can maybe sit towards. The left corner. Or can we move the screen over? Can we put the screen up? No, no the screen's so. permanent. Right there. Is that better? Fabulous. Fabulous. So try not to be at the head of the table. We can talk about why that's a strategy, an important strategy. Um, okay, happy to be here. Thank you for making this happen. I'm uh, on book tour. My book just came out. And so um, only in New York for a couple of days. And nice that I could sneak in and chat with you guys. So um, interrupt any time. Um, have a conversation. Um, okay, so why trust? Um, I've been studying trust for about 15 years. Uh, the early 2000s, uh, I derived a relationship, um, which now has been replicated, uh, showing why trust improves economic <coughs> performance. And skipping all the mathematics, essentially are two mechanisms uh, to, to think that trust is important uh, in this paper. One is that uh, when trust is high, you reduce transaction costs, right? So Mitchell and I want to do a deal. Um, uh, I certainly want Seth involved to do some contract work, but we can shake hands and go lift with the lawyers and work it out, and we're, we're going to make this thing happen, right? So that's very effective. Uh, the second is that trust reduces the risk that the deal will fall through because it reduces the, the um, lack of reliability of a trading partner, right? So you have two levels. You have sort of a level effect and a, and a variance effect that both uh, increased economic performance, and strongly predicts, for example, which countries will be uh, growing faster. Uh, it, it turns out that trust is a very powerful predictor uh, because it's uh, kind of a, the word mathematics is sufficient statistic. It's kind of one measure that captures lots of good things happening at the level of a company, at the level of a country, uh, or even between individuals. Um, so uh, this work had a, had a of impact, the World Bank flies me out, you know, how do we, how do we increase trust in these developing countries? And I'd always get this uh, question, which was, if I don't know somebody for a given country or a given location, why would I ever trust him or her in a tangible way? And I said, well, I can tell you about the environments in which trust is higher, the kind of governments, kind of, uh, and it seems like that was the key question, right? We're always interacting with strangers. I think of New York, living in this sea of strangers, how do we actually determine Robert, uh, right, wonderful guy, want to hang out with him. Nora, clear, clearly a sketchy person, don't want to be around her too much. <laughs> so what, the only way we can live around strangers and interact with people is to have something in our head that says roughly, this person I want to be around, that person doesn't seem to be safe. It doesn't have to be perfect, right, because it's the evolved, it's evolved process. So uh, by looking for that mechanism, um, so in the mid 2000s, uh, we identify with the first, first lab to identify this brain chemical oxytocin as a key signaling molecule that tells us that someone around us appears to be safe or familiar or trustworthy. And uh, spent about 10 years identifying what induces uh, the brain to make this chemical, what inhibits it, uh, and showed that uh, essentially any positive social interaction we have will, it, will cause the brain to make oxytocin, usually, and usually, of course, is important, and will cause you want to reciprocate, right? So Robert seems safe, uh, my brain makes this chemical, it motivates me to interact with him, and then we can derive some kind of value from that relationship. Right? And we do that really rapidly, right? With strangers, we can get a sense right away of someone I want to hang around with. Uh, and that could just be being friends, it could be a romantic relationship, it could be a business relationship. Right? We're, just, we're just finding ways to create value, and the only reason we can do that is because we're much more sensitive to this chemical in a, in a real anatomical way than uh, any other mammal. It's a purely mammalian a chemical, and as Nora said, is also classically associated with birth and, breath, birth and breastfeeding and care for offspring. Um, but the work we're doing is talking about oxytocin not in the breast or in the uterus, but in the brain. And so we had to develop technologies that allowed, allowed us to measure that very rapid brain response without drilling a hole into people's heads. <laughs> so anyway, wrote a book in 2012 called The Moral Molecule about how this, this uh, brain chemical uh, motivates positive social behaviors because otherwise the group figures out uh, that we're not fair players and we get ostracized. Um, so 
as we did this work, some companies started knocking on my lab door and saying, hey, we think trust is pretty important in our business. Can you tell us how to uh, increase trust at work? Um, and, then, and, and drive the benefits from that. And so, uh, you know, because I love to be in my lab, my first answer was, sure, I can draw blood from your uh, employees and, and, you know, their face would turn white. No, I can't do that. <laughs> and it also felt like, you know, if I'm some trust expert and I can't actually tell businesses how to actually create a culture of trust and gain these benefits, um, you know, what kind of expert am I? So uh, we began running experiments uh, all around the world, uh, including at for-profit businesses, to identify the kinds of factors that would induce uh, high-trust workplaces. Um, so. Uh, one of those, these pictures is, is me with a tribe uh, in the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. Literally went around the world uh, measuring oxytocin, measuring productivity for people while they worked. In every setting, I, people would let me in on. Uh, and, and a number of companies uh, in the book allowed me to actually use their data, including Zappos, Sherman Miller, uh, a bunch of other companies. So um, we did that, we measured productivity took blood draws while people work, measured their productivity, and then used that to essentially reverse engineer what are the building blocks to build a high trust culture, and then develop a survey tool that we could capture those building blocks and then quantify how well your culture works. So, so anyway, uh, the, uh, the oxytocin effect is uh, important. Uh, it has many downstream effects on the brain, reduces physiologic stress, um, increases the sense of closeness to other people, and so you think about teamwork, if I want to be a team with someone, it not only helps that I understand cognitively what he or she, uh, what their goals are, uh, but as Robert said, I also want to understand emotionally why you want something, why you care about something. And oxytocin enhances our sense of empathy. So I'm a much more effective team member if I get a sense of what you really care about. Right? So um, that's another benefit that we've seen in businesses. So we just kind of go through the kind of model that we're taking up. So it turned out there are eight uh, building blocks for organizational trust. And somehow, magically, they have the acronym oxytocin. Wow, I don't know how that happened. So the idea here is that you can push on one or more of these factors. That will increase organizational trust. I'm going to show you a lot of data in a second. Right? So we're just, I'm just uh, 30,000 feet, we're going to get down to ground level in a second. It turns out the neuroscience predicts that trust combined with purpose, I'm going to define that very carefully, uh, are reinforcing in terms of building a culture of trust and high performance. When you have high trust and high purpose, you get greater engagement at work, uh, greater customer service, and the neuroscience makes a very specific prediction, which is high trust, high purpose organizations will have employees that like want to work. Work will become fun. Uh, and then when work is fun, you perform better. Mm -hmm. right? So again, the causation here is really important. It's not about, um, you know, if you guys saw my HBR article, it's not about, uh, you know, Taco Tuesdays and Karaoke Fridays. It's really about doing something important, purpose, with a trusted team. That that process of doing that that makes work enjoyable. So, um, uh, Zappos been a long time uh, client of mine, and it took me a long time, years, to convince them you don't want to make your employees happy. We'll talk about the neuroscience of that in a minute. You want them to feel happy at the end of doing something important. So. Little, little different there. All right, are, so, go ahead. Is your presentation going to be available with, with these slides? Can we get them from you? Sure, of course. Okay. Yeah, I'll send them to Kevin and you can okay. shoot them around for sure. Thank you. Feel free to steal, borrow. Uh, with attribution. W without attribution. <laughs> no, I have to help yourself. Okay, so here, here are the eight uh, uh, components. I'm going to define these just briefly and give you a sense of, of what they are. Uh, and I'll tell you how closely they're related to trust. So in the book, we have case studies of companies we've worked with that have implemented these policies. We have uh, data from a nationally representative sample of working adults we collected in 2016. So lots of data there. And then we built this, this uh, piece of software and dashboard so that companies can actually measure and manage the culture for high trust. So if trust really does have these powerful properties on performance, then you don't want to take culture as given. And culture to me is this big, massive term, but I want to take a, a really rigorous slice on part of that, which is building a culture of high trust. So um, you could build all kinds of things in the culture. Culture is sort of norms of behavior. So people together are always going to form a culture. They're just going to have these implicit norms of behavior. What I'm advocating is that 
you can measure managed culture for higher performance, right? It's not just given, it's not stuck. You can actually manage it. And once you can measure it, you can manage it. Okay, so let me go through these just really briefly. Each of these, I'm also putting down the amount of explained variation for those factors for organizational trust. So the 61% is 61% of the variation in organizational trust uh, is explained by oxytocin, uh, sorry, explained by ovation. Um, uh, because each of those eight factors is not statistically independent, they're gonna add up to more than one, but they're all highly associated with trust. If it was 2%, it wouldn't be very interesting. Right? Even if it was statistically associated, it's like, well, I could push on this factor, but I'm not gonna get much out of it. So they're all very highly associated. So I'm, I'm putting the, the numbers in there just so that you, you know, recognize that there's something going on here. Okay, so ovation is my word for recognizing high performers. Right? So Kathy will say, Gosh, I don't know, like the first week in business school, I learned that, like, you know, recognition is important to the humans. But the neuroscience for each of these has very specific ways to get the most impact on brain and behavior. Right, so recognition that's focused on meeting goals, not just on trying, that's close in time to when the goal is met, which is personal, tangible, which comes from peers, which is unexpected. All those have a bigger impact on the feedback loop in the brain that says, oh, in my community, they value high performers, mm -hmm. right? So you want to create these tight feedback loops that say, this is what we do in our community, in community at work. When you do these public ovations, you also set aspirations for other people, right? So it's not only great that, that you got recognized or your team got recognized for performing well, but you're setting up a new norm, a new standard, a new, a new community standard that says that we want high performers to do their thing. Also, when you do public ovations, it gives you a chance to share best practices. So every project I've ever done, eventually something bad happens, right? Some, we start losing data, we, you know, something gets lost, uh, the, the, the goalposts move. And so when you recognize these high performers publicly, say, well, uh, Mitchell did this amazing job. Tell us about, about this project you just finished for three months. It's gonna say, first of all, whenever you do that and you, and you identify the team leader, he or she will always say, yeah, but Seth helped me and, oh, I forgot your name. Daisy. Daisy, Daisy helped me. So, right, so now we get to recognize a team, and then um, Mitchell would say, but, but, and Daisy did this amazing thing. Two weeks ago, all the data was lost, we were screwed, you know, your client's gonna fail us, and, and she found a way with the IT people to use a backup, that save and blah, blah, blah. So now we get to talk about what happens when something goes wrong, or some innovation you made. So we found that typically we do this project this way, but Daisy and her group found that we could actually save three steps if we blah, 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 right? So, so it's not just recognizing our performers, but it's actually sharing the information broadly so that people have that. And it says, oh yes, so when I get into trouble, I know Daisy's team now has this special knowledge, I should use that special model. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, operationally defined, what you mean by ovation? Are you not? Are you actually clapping? Okay. What you, what I, you, I defined it, and you didn't hear me. I sorry. It's a tangible, personal, uh, uh, unexpected, all those things. So I'm going to have a celebration when that project's over, within a week of that project finishing. Got it. I said it sorry. quickly, but you missed it. Right. Ask a question. Always ask questions, you guys. So. So it could be just this, thank you, or it could be something tangible. So think about your, your, your wife. If you just showed up with, a, I don't know, a, a vacuum cleaner at Valentine's Day, <laughs> right. not so cool. But if you know she loves chocolate, you know chocolate, so I want to know a lot about my team. So for Mitchell, I know Mitchell loves uh, a, a good bottle of whiskey. And so I, I want to, he finished his big project, I want to come and say something special about you, Mitchell. You are so amazing publicly give this to you and recognize that, yeah, you worked your butt off to make this thing happen, mm -hmm. right? So, Thank you. yeah, he did, he was great. <laughs> what about, you know, when uh, I was in office and yeah. the employee of the month, that's how they provide ovation oh, or recognition. Right. Right. Well, that's the worst, right? Because it's not goal-oriented, it's not, so from the brain's perspective, I wanna, I wanna uh, match goals with celebrations, right? So that now I'm sitting at this feedback loop. Yes, I can plug them on the parking place, it just moves around. So again, it's not from a from a brain perspective. It's not a tight linkage. It's just like, ah, you were cool this month. So it's got to be live. It's got to yeah. be show recognition. Uh, yeah, and, let, and having peers vote on it. So I'll give you there's lots of examples in the book, but here's an example of a company called uh, Barry Wigmiller, which is a, a privately owned company in St. Louis. Owns about 65 small manufacturing companies. So they find these companies that make essentially automation equipment. 
that are not very well run, they're local, and they pick them over. So they have these plants. This is, this is blue collar workers. And what they do is they have their, their uh, at each plant, people vote for which employee improved their life the most. That's an interesting set of wording, right? Not was most productive, improved their life. They close the plant, they have this big celebration, quietly invite the spouses, the friends of that person who's being recognized, and then they read these letters. So here's what these people did, and then you get the keys to a sports car for two weeks to drive around. Wow. Oh, Bright yellow sports car. By the way, the CEO told me the first thing everybody does is to drive that car to mom's house. Hey mom, guess what I got? Uh -huh. I, all, the, the, the hundred guys in my plant voted me the best guy. So again, that's not perfect because it's not tightly linked to when that project was finished, but this is you know, manufacturing, so it's you know, probably relatively constant kind of work. So that's great, it's public, it's unexpected, uh, it's, it sets up aspirations. I wanna be that guy. I think I a sports car for a couple weeks. What's the record for how far away mom's house is when they drive it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Cross country, I'm going. Right, right. Uh, yeah. like six states away. These are, these are small towns, you know, and uh, they've done a lot of interesting things. They keep the name of the company. So they buy a company, but they keep that local name. Uh, and they do a lot of listening, you know. Um, a lot of these companies are run, this is a little bit of an aside, but you know, they're, they're machining stuff, right? So you have replacement tools. And they took over this company and uh, uh